Good morning. Good morning. Welcome to our service of worship this morning, uh, Sunday, October 15th. So far it's a beautiful day, but a little cool in here. If you need to cuddle up, that's okay too, because the furnace isn't going, I guess. But uh, We welcome all those today uh, that are joining us online and through our tablet ministry as well. Uh, before we begin, a few announcements. <clears throat> Our fall Bible study is continuing. This week we're looking at chapters 6, 7, and 8. So if you'd like to come out and you'd like to pre-read those chapters, you're more than welcome to do that. Uh, our turkey dinner takeout uh, is going to be happening November 18th, and tickets are $20, and uh, more details will come. Uh, I'm going to be away tomorrow evening until about Wednesday afternoon. Uh, we have Synod in New Glasgow, Nova Scotia, uh, so I'll be away, but if you need to contact me, uh, please, please do. Uh, we're going to be having a joint session meeting um, on Monday, October 23rd, 7 o'clock at the Kensington Church. Uh, so I sent that out to the elders, but if you can just uh, mark that on your calendar, that would be great. Uh, the new Today devotionals are out, the latest issues, so I've put them at both doors there. Uh, so November and December issues are available for you if you like that. And this morning after service, we're having a fellowship time here in New London, so if uh, please stay and maybe hot coffee or hot tea will warm you up after this. And also the Kensington Lions Club is having their uh, annual ham and potato scallop dinner takeout. That's happening uh, Saturday, October 28th. Um, from 11 till 1, tickets are $18, and you can talk to uh, Wayne or Bev at the other church or any Lions member to get tickets for that. Would anybody like to uh, have time to share something that you're thankful for this week? So for craft dinner this week, the communication line had to come through. We had uh, 21 seniors, which is a uh, record, and we had uh, 43 juniors. <coughs> Yeah, which is about 20 more than we've ever had, I think. <laughs> yeah. Oh, yeah. Yeah, so it was wonderful. 19 boxes of Kraft Dinner gone. <laughs> but no, it's great. It seems to be the, the uh, kids are really enjoying it this year, so it's wonderful. And thank you, to everybody, for supporting that ministry. All right, well, let us come and let us worship. And as we sing our intro, it's come in, come in, and sit down. Join me in the call to worship. We gather in God's holy presence where God embraces us with grace. Through your God will transform us into disciples. We glorify God who yearns for justice for the last and the least. Through your God will bring compassion on our hearts. We give thanks to God for God's persistent love that seeks us out. Here your God will Amen. Let us join as we sing, Love Lifted Me.
seated. Let us pray. God of all time and space, you've called people to meet you over the centuries in many different places, in many different ways, and we praise you for welcoming and receiving us as we are. You hear our prayers and claim us as your own. In this hour of worship, Send your spirit upon us to revive our faith and guide our footsteps in the way of Jesus Christ, your Son and our Savior. God of all life, you know all about us. You know our deepest concerns and our fondest hopes. However, we confess we're often anxious to see results. We lose patience when we can't see progress. We blame others rather than seek solutions. Lord, forgive us and help us claim your peace when our hearts are fearful. Lord, open our hearts with your great love and hear us as we pray. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. And give us this day our daily bread. And forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, the power, and the glory forever. Amen. Friends, while it is true we have all sinned, it is a greater truth that we are forgiven through God's love in Jesus Christ. So be at peace with God, with yourselves, and with one another. Amen. Let's join as we sing Days of Elijah.
Let us pray. God of creation, we gather. We gather to listen to the scriptures read and proclaimed. So by your spirit, we ask that you'd grant us fresh understanding and that you'd challenge us to live according to your transforming grace. Amen. Our responsive reading today comes from Psalm 23. The Lord is my shepherd, I shall not want. He restores my soul. He leads me in right paths for his name's sake. You prepare a table before me in the presence of my enemies. You anoint my head with oil. My cup overflows. Amen. Gospel reading today comes from the Gospel of Matthew, chapter 22, reading the first 14 verses. Once more, Jesus spoke to them in parables, saying, The kingdom of heaven may be compared to a king who gave a wedding banquet for his son. He sent his slaves to call those who had been invited to the wedding banquet, but they would not come. 
Again, he sent other slaves, saying, Tell those who have been invited, Look, I have prepared my dinner. My oxen and my fat calves have been slaughtered, and everything is ready. Come to the wedding banquet. But they made light of it and went away, one to his farm, another to his business. While the rest seized his slaves, mistreated them, and killed them. The king was enraged. He sent his troops, destroyed those murderers, and burned their city. Then he said to his slaves, The wedding is ready, but those invited were not worthy. <coughs> Go therefore into the main streets and invite everyone you find to the wedding banquet. Those slaves went out into the streets and gathered all whom they found, both good and bad. So the wedding hall was filled with guests. But when the king came in to see the guests, he noticed a man there who was not wearing a wedding robe. And he said to him, Friend, how did you get in here without a wedding robe? And he was speechless. Then the king said to the attendants, Bind him hand and foot and throw him into the outer darkness where there will be weeping and gnashing of teeth. For many are called, but few are chosen. This is the word of the Lord. <laughs> Last weekend, in honor of Thanksgiving, my parents invited the family to come over for a turkey dinner. They invited myself and Ange and the girls, my in-laws and niece, my brother and his family, as well as my aunt and uncle, and a cousin who was also visiting for a couple days. It was going to be a big crowd with 16 of us in total. Although out of caution because of COVID uh, in the hospital where my brother works, his family didn't come. But still, we had 12 of us looking forward to sharing a meal together. And in preparation, my parents ordered a large turkey. And Dad went out and pre-bought as much food as possible. To help, Ange and I donated a couple squash from our garden and we were bringing pies for dessert. And as the day approached, Mom and Dad cleaned the house and made sure everything was tidy. Mom got out her silverware and shined it up and got it ready. They extended the dining room table and even added a card table so that the table could accommodate everyone. They laid the tablecloth and got out the fine china. Mom placed small gourds and decorations on the table along with candles. She found her all her fall napkins and put them around at each seat. And after much fuss, after many preparations, the table was set the house prepared for guests. On Saturday, they set out the task of preparing the food. Mom tore up the bread and added the butter and onions and spices to make the dressing while Dad prepared the bird. Then after stuffing the turkey, they popped it into the oven. Later, Mom pierced the squash and stuck them in the oven alongside the turkey. She cooked up cranberries on the stove, peeled potatoes, put them in a pot. And when turkey was almost cooked, they boiled the potatoes and then mashed them. They took the squash out of the oven and spooned out the flesh into serving bowls. And once the turkey was done, Dad pulled it out and carved it. The dressing was placed in a bowl and put in the warming oven. Gravy was made and peas on to cook. Rolls were placed in a basket. Everything was coming together. The whole house smelled amazing. And once everything was ready, Mom and Dad invited everyone to come for the meal. We all sat down at the festive table filled with all delicious smelling food. We began with everyone taking a turn to share what they were thankful for. Then we said grace and with our mouths watering and stomachs rumbling, we started passing the dishes and filling up our plates. It was a wonderful meal complete with the sharing of stories and lots of laughter. And after filling ourselves with turkey and all the fixings, we somehow found room for a slice or two of homemade apple or pumpkin or rhubarb pie. And by the end, we were all stuffed. We were all quite content. But what would have it been like if no one had shown up to partake in that meal? How would my parents have felt if the family had declined to attend, especially after mom and dad had spent all that time cleaning and tidying and decorating and preparing and cooking the meal? I'm sure they would have been upset. No doubt they would have felt hurt or disappointed, frustrated, perhaps even confused. They would certainly have every right to feel angry or betrayed. If the circumstances were reversed and we were the ones hosting, I think all of us can imagine what it would be like to go through all the trouble of prepping a big meal and having no one show up. We certainly wouldn't be happy. At least I wouldn't. 
Our scripture reading is like the ones we've looked at in the past couple of weeks. Specifically, we were looking at the parable of the two sons and the parable of the wicked servants. And again, here we find Jesus speaking to the religious leaders in Jerusalem. And he's emphasizing the fact that we're called to follow God's will. Just as we saw in the other parables, we can see the parallels between the characters in the stories and real life. For example, in today's parable, we have the king who may be interpreted as God, his son as Jesus, the original guests as the religious leaders, and the later guests representing all people. However, like the two previous parables that we've looked at, we must acknowledge and understand that the stories aren't literal interpretations. In other words, not everything that takes place in these parables represents how things will happen or exactly how God will react. Our story begins with a king giving a wedding banquet for his son, and presuming, presumably his daughter-in-law as well. And when the time comes, he sends out his slaves to call and invite the guests to the party, but they don't show up. So the king sent other slaves saying, tell those who have been invited, look, I've prepared my dinner, my oxen, my fat calves have been slaughtered. Everything is ready. Come, come to the wedding banquet. But they made light of it and went away, one on his farm, one to his business, while the rest seized his slave. Slaves mistreated them and killed them. Not surprisingly, the king was angry that he was upset with their decision. And infuriated by the humiliation and the disrespect, the king sent his troops, destroyed those murderers, and burned their city. Now, if my invited guests hadn't shown up to a dinner I'd prepared, especially something as expensive and elaborate as a wedding feast, I too would be upset. But would I react the way the king did in this parable? I really hope not. It might be a little bit of an overreaction and definitely illegal, not to mention damaging to my family relationships if I'd sent people out to kill those who hadn't come and or to burn down their homes. Surely there's a better response. Let me be clear, as I've said, this isn't necessarily how God would react to those who didn't take up his invitation. We have to remember that we can't take everything literally here. The king in this story is like God, but not the same as God. Therefore, let's not dwell too much on the killing and the burnings, and instead, let's focus on what comes next. As the king said to his slaves, the wedding is ready, but those invited were not worthy. Go, therefore, into the main streets. Invite everyone you find to the wedding banquet. Those slaves went out into the streets, and they gathered all whom they found, both good and bad, So the wedding hall was filled with guests. So if my guests chose not to come, I think like the king does here, I'd be more likely to invite others to our home to enjoy the meal that we'd prepared. I mean, why let all that food, why let those decorations and the time and the energy all go to waste? But would we actually go out into the streets? Would we actually go out and invite strangers in? I'm not convinced. I'd probably start with neighbors. I'd start with friends who hadn't been initially invited to the party. If I had to guess, many of you might do the same. However, maybe, maybe some of you would open your doors to all those who would come, including strangers. When you think about it, welcoming neighbors and even strangers isn't really that hard of a task. In this case, the food is ready, the table's set. All we need is people to come. All we need is people to come and share in the feast. So it should only be natural that we just open our doors, that we'd invite all who would like to come. But still, we hesitate. At least I find I do. But not the king, not God. Faced with an empty banquet hall, he calls on his servants to go out into the streets and the alleys, offering invitations to everyone who'd like to come, whoever they are, whatever they've done. He offers this gracious invitation to everyone because all he wants is for the feast to be full. All he wants is for as many possible to come and to enjoy what he's prepared. Our role as followers of Jesus and his church is to be his servants and to invite people to the wedding feast. 
We're called to go out and to share who God is and what Jesus has done and invite those we encounter to experience God's gracious banquet set out before us. It's an invitation for everyone, those we know and those we don't. There are no limits to whom God welcomes. The king clearly tells his servants to offer an invitation to the good and the bad. Now, we might be tempted to pass judgment or want to decide for ourselves who should be allowed and who shouldn't enter God's feast. But it isn't up to us. Our role is simply to offer up the invitation to encourage people to join our Lord at his table. It's up to them whether they choose to accept or not. Going back to the parable, there's a short, almost side story near the end where the king came in to see the guests and he noticed a man who was not wearing a wedding robe. And he said to him, friend, how did you get in here without a wedding robe? And the man was speechless. After which the king calls on his servants to bind him and throw him out into the darkness. Again, not focusing necessarily on the harsh treatment of the robeless guest. There's a lesson here. When we accept our Savior's invitation, when we come to his banquet, our lives are changed. We must shed our old clothes, our old ways, and live out a new life in Christ. And in doing so, we come to put on clothes for his feast. It's these new garments that identify us as God's children, as God's servants. There's no denying that we're not perfect. No doubt, as followers and believers of Jesus, our wedding robes will have stains and signs of wear from those messy times in our lives. If you look closely, you'll see tears and rips marking those times where we've wandered and got our clothes caught or tangled on thorny situations. Yet still, we're called to wear our robes that identify us as God's children. We're to wear them so that others may know who we are and who we serve. We're to imitate Christ. We're to live our lives as he calls us to be. As God's children, we've been invited to his banquet feast. And as faithful followers of Christ, we've accepted this invitation and we've put on our robes. As God's servants, may we follow our Heavenly Father's will. May we do his works in Jesus' name. May we go out. May we invite others to this feast. May we not cast judgment or pick and choose. Instead, may we spread the gospel to everyone we meet because God's invitation extends to all. Amen. Loving God, you extend an invitation to everyone for your heavenly feast. And Lord, as your faithful servants, we rejoice that you've called us to partake in this gracious meal. In response, may we listen to your calling. May we follow your will as we go out and as we extend our invitation to those around us. Savior, may we be put aside our pride. May we put aside our prejudices, our hesitations, our misgivings as we seek to tell others about you. All this we ask in Jesus' name. Amen. So what does it feel like to accept God's invitation to his feast? And what holds you back from inviting others to God's banquet table? Our mission moment this week the hardening of the U.S. sanctions and the global financial crisis are contributing to a shortage of fuel, food, clean water, and medicine in Cuba. With partners' support, the Evangelical Seminary of Theology in Matanzas carries on, providing high-quality, diversified theological education and serving the community through diagonal, pro diagonal projects. In 2022, the Presbyterian Church of Canada helped improve the infrastructure for hybrid teaching and assisted with the renovation to the library and the historical archive. The Reverend Dr. Carlos Ham, rector, shared at the 2023 General Assembly, quote, we appreciate the ways in which you accompany our work, not only providing much needed financial support, but also through prayers. May we keep 
the people in Cuba and this ministry that's taking place there in our thoughts and prayers. The Apostle Paul urges to think on things that are honorable and just, commendable and true, to share what we have is honorable. Our gifts can help create justice. Our gifts can work for truth to prevail. So trust your gifts to God and know they are pleasing to God. Our offerings will now be received. Generous God, we offer to you part of the abundance that you've shared with us. We ask that you bless our gifts and you'd work through them so that others will know of your generosity, that others will be touched by your love through the kindness that we can offer in Jesus' name. Amen. Let us join together in saying, open my eyes that I may see. Let us pray. Heavenly Father, in a world where many would seek to damage your creation, bring hatred to your people, and show violence to your children, Lord, help us to be grateful for the gifts of love and life. And we give thanks for the glimpses of transforming beauty and unending wonder. As your servants, may we seek to combat evil and destruction wherever we find it and to spread your love. Heavenly Father, in a world driven by greed and lust for power, where material wants and desires threaten to overwhelm the spiritual, where goodness seems to be frail in the face of bad, Lord, help us not to give up on righteousness and truth. 
as your servants, help us to believe that you can use the gifts that we offer. And may we answer your call and use what you've given to us to help your people. Heavenly Father, in a world where people are broken by the works and deeds of others, Lord, help us to trust the healing of your blessings and love. Lord, we pray for those who seek to face down injustice and champion human rights. We pray for those who stand in dark places with your light held high, giving hope to those in desperate need. We pray for those who give of themselves for the sake of others. Heavenly Father, in a world where we struggle to understand pain and suffering, and especially in the lives of those we love, Lord, bring healing. We pray for those who weep as they experience loss and grief. We pray for those who hurt and deal with health issues and uncertainties. We pray for those in hospital and who are recovering. We pray for those living in times of transition and change. Heavenly Father, in a world where war and violence destroys lives and livelihoods, Lord, help us to live in hope and for peace. We pray for nations who are locked in conflict. We pray for the innocent who find themselves in the middle. We pray for cooler heads to prevail. Lord, we especially think of the fighting in Israel and Gaza, as well as in Ukraine. But we don't forget about all the other places around the world that don't make the news. Oh God, we give you thanks because you hear our prayers and know our every need. And in this time of silence, we lift up to you our joys and our concerns.